thanks for having me. Thanks for, uh, to Rona and to Kate in particular for inviting me uh, to come out tonight and share some insights with you. Um, I do work in negotiation. I do a lot of experimental work. And yes, one of the, that boring sounding paper really was about how feminine faces, whether those faces are owned by men or women, um, are helpful in some cases for negotiators. That is when somebody's selecting you to be their partner. Partners like um, feminine faces, um, in part because they think you're going to be cooperative. So that is the stereotype about feminine faces, that these are cooperative faces. Um, they do encourage the other side to compete. So we've got a, a lot of research that's, we as my laboratory, so the folks in my lab and I have a bunch of emergent research around sort of women and, and men in negotiation. I've moved along a little bit from that and I'm now part of a, a well, spearheading a project now looking at women's decisions over the life course. So how professional women make decisions. So mostly interested in women at the very beginning of their career but all the way through, uh, through retirement. So how we make decisions, what are the trade-offs that they perceive, um, which is actually fascinating. And my takeaway from that, I'll share with you, because I'm not talking about the research tonight, um, is be brave. It doesn't matter if the women I interview are 75, or 35, or 25. When you say, what advice would you give to your younger self? They say, be brave. Be brave, speak up, say something. Don't put up with that, right? Don't do it, right? So in retrospect, they say, not that there aren't consequences, there are. But you know, let yourself get fired if you need to, and you'll find something else that's better, right? So, so that's a bold statement, but I'm going to leave that with you, because that's one of the themes that's been really emergent for us. All right, let's get into the art and science of persuasion. I, have not gi I had not given this talk in such a long time, and Kate said, you could talk about anything you want. So I said, ah, geez, I gotta, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to think about this a little bit more. Um, so it's absolutely tailored for you, because I hadn't given this to a women's audience before. Um, and I really want to highlight what separates men and women in terms, of their, uh, uh, in terms of what they need to do and be and look like to be persuasive, OK? So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so, so for some people, this is a very threatening picture, right? So you're standing there, and what are you going to say, right? And in most of these kind of situations, you have to persuade. I have to persuade you tonight that I know something about persuasion, right? And that I've got a message that's going to speak to you and that you can do something with, right? So that's, this is part of what I think is often, uh, often daunting. When we think about persuasion, we're really thinking about, trying to get over this hump, um, what we're really thinking about is how do I become a leader? How do I get people to follow me? Whether it's an idea for a new product or process, whether it's in your performance evaluations, you're trying to persuade your boss, whomever's doing the, the evaluation, that you've done a better job that she or he may think you have done, right? It's trying to get someone on your team, right, to be persuaded to influence them to choose the option you think is best for the team, right? These, we face these all the time, right? We're trying to get people to follow us. That's what, that's what persuasion is all about. That's where I'm focusing today. So we could look at this as a one-on-one, -on -one. We could look at this as you influencing a smaller team around you, or in a big group like this, trying to get everybody, move everybody along in a particular direction. I'm going to be a little bit agnostic about what level I'm talking about. I'm going to try to give you some tools that can help across a range of situations. Okay, so and it, your mileage may vary a little bit, but I think you'll, I think I've got some universals in here. So let's start with this. Let's start with this woman. By the way, if you look for a woman silhouette in an image search. A lot of them are naked, which is weird. Um, I'm not sure what people are using those for, but it's interesting. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to just find a woman just standing on two feet. Very easy to find a man just standing on two feet. Women are always sort of this, or there's somehow this happening. Anyway, so I, but I found one that I thought was not too objectionable. Although those heels are, there are platforms. Anyway, all right. So we can be persuasive in terms of how we look the image that we're presenting. We can also be persuasive in terms of the words that we're using, okay? I'm much more focused tonight on how we present ourselves than I am on the words that we use. And the reason is pretty clear. It's because you can find very good suggestions on the words you use in these kinds of resources. And by the way, I, I make these slides available, so these slides can be made available. Um, there are three wonderful books out there that are very practical and will teach you exactly what you need to know to say the thing that's going to persuade someone. 
So I'm not going to waste your time. Go order the books, right? I'm giving them to you. Bob Cialdini has a book, a classic on influence. Adam Grant has a newer book the last four years called Give and Take, which is beautiful. And I think the most practical and most useful is called The Art of Woo. Use, if you don't have this one on your bookshelves, given the, 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 the industry that you work in, you have to get this last one, right? So The Art of Woo, Using Strategic Persuasion to Sell. OK, so that's out there. So I'm not going to waste your time talking about pecan and all these other things, right? We're going to talk about other stuff instead. All right, so write those down. So here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this woman. And we're going to put her in p relative to men, women relative to men. I'm going to pull back from the men pretty quickly because I actually don't do a lot. I don't like to do a lot of comparisons to men and women because oftentimes when there are differences, we try to fix the women. Right? When we see differences between men and women, it's like, what we, can we do to fix the women? We're not broken. I'm not sure why the men are the standard, right? So I don't like to spend a lot of time on the comparison. In fact, again, the research I'm doing on women decision making, people always say, what about the men? I was like, Some, that's somebody else's problem, <laughs> right? Like, that's not what I do, right? So we don't, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a political statement, and I'm standing by it, right? But we're not going to do a lot of that comparison. Tonight I am just to show you what women are up against. OK, so imagine we have two people, any two people, any one person. We make judgments about people sort of, I, I think it's like 45 milliseconds or something. I don't remember the exact number of second, milliseconds, right? But instantly, as soon as you meet a new face, you make an assessment. And you make an assessment along two critical dimensions. How warm the person is that is likable. Some of you know this work, right? So how likable someone is and how credible they are. There's all sorts of kind of post hoc evolutionary psychology that tries to justify why, right? If someone's credible and competent, they can help you build fire, right? If someone's likable, right, and warm, right, they're not going to hurt you, and maybe there's some mating opportunities there, right? So we have to make this, we make these assessments all the time credibility and likability, okay? As soon as someone stands in front of you, you're making this assessment, okay? What is this? So this comes right out of some, uh, something called the stereotype content model, which is pulled together, which has kind of come together. Susan Fisk and Amy Cuddy have done a lot of this early work. It's probably been around since the early 2000s. And there's been a ton of documentation around this. By the way, they didn't set out to study men and women. They were looking at perceptions of a variety of different groups. right? Any kind of ethnic or social group you can think of, they've tried to study them in terms of how warm and how competent people judge those groups to be. That's why it's called stereotypes. What are the, st people are stereotyped. What's the content on these two dimensions? And I'll show you the dimensions um, for men and women in just a minute. Okay, let's start a little bit with the men. And again, this is done for, for illustration purposes. You can't see this, so I'm gonna circle them and tell you about them, okay? So you can see these are what a scientist would call orthogonal. There's no overlap in judgments of warmth and competence, meaning you can be high on competence and low on warmth, or vice versa, or high on both and low on both. There's no overlap between them. They are distinct dimensions. OK, I don't exact. This was work that was collected in 2002. It has been replicated since then. This is the original stuff by um, Eckes. You know, I don't know, CAD, I, I don't know what it, right, CAD, that's kind of weird, and BUM, Rocker. Uh, I don't know exactly where they got all of their labels from, but let's not worry about those. Let's focus on two in particular that are going to make the point for us. Here is a typical man. This, these data, by the way, were collected in the US and in parts of Europe. Right? So that gives you a sense of, of the context here. A typical man, I put the lines in. The lines are the midpoints on the scales. These are five-point scales. So two and a half, two and a half. This is the midpoint um, for both of them. A typical man is relatively high on competence and pretty average on warmth. Typical man. Where is the manager, so a professional man, right? There's a manager here. There's a career man here. I don't know the difference. I usually go with um, manager in this uh, when I talk about this because I think it's more of a day-to-day. -day. It seems a little bit more specific to me. So see how close they are? A manager is a little bit less warm and a little bit more competent. But these generally are close. And I can say they're close because I know the data that's coming for the women. OK, so a typical man and a manager are not that different. A manager's got, again, slightly less warmth and slightly more competence. OK, hold on to your seats, because I'm going to tell you something else. So there are a whole bunch of stereotypes of women. 
that both men and women hold about women. This isn't about how they judge us, it's about how we judge women and men judge women. And they tend to be fairly well shared, by the way, right? Competent people tend to have higher status in their groups. If you think about a group that you're in, somebody who's really competent at whatever the group is doing tends to be afforded a higher status. They, we listen to their opinions. They, we, if they don't talk enough, we try to pull them out. Right? Competence tends to win in a status contest in groups. Competent people are also more influential than people who are less competent, which for some of us, well, that's a relief. right? I mean, in certain situations, that's good to know. OK, more influential. In general, women are perceived to be less competent than men, by both men and women, and therefore they are, in general, less influential. They're less influential because they are judged in head-to-head -head battles as being less competent than the men are. So they're given less status and they're less influential. The theory behind this isn't interesting for you sociologists in the room. It's status characteristics theory. The characteristics you have have implications for the status you are given, and this becomes sort of a uh, a self-filling prophecy, right? If you're not afforded high status, you don't behave as though you have high status. If you do try to behave as though you have high status, you get smacked down because it's inappropriate, right? It becomes very, very difficult, right, to do this. Okay. So these are stereotypes of women. Let me show you how it looks on that two by two with the um, competence and the warmth. By the way, I'm just rolling through this. If you have a question, uh, don't run screaming out of the room. I mean, it's a little depressing, but we'll pull it up again, right? So I'm. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to leave you with a really depressing message. I mean, yeah, well, for sure. We'll, right, we'll drink it out after. But, <laughs> but also, feel free to jump in if you want a clarification or question. I just will keep rolling on it, OK? OK, and I believe that there is space for it anyway. OK, so I can't see this. OK, so once again, this is, let's, let's look. Remember how close together the typical man and the manager was, right? They weren't that different. Look at a typical woman here. A typical woman, here's the midpoint. Is, right, is sort of average, a little below average, so roughly average in competence. Look how high she is in warmth. Likeable. Typical woman is pretty likable, but much lower than the typical man on competence. Remember, because I gave you the midpoints. You can see where they are, so we can do the comparisons, right? Look at the person down here who's called career woman. <laughs> now, not far from career man, and not that far from manager either, right? There's something about holding that position. Look how far she is, the career woman. Look how dislikable she is relative to a typical woman. You want to really be sad about, about our fellow women out there? Look at the housewife. Apparently, she's an idiot, <laughs> right? She's got no competence. And you know that that's not true. But that's the stereotype that both men and women carry around about housewives, right? Is that they're obviously not very competent. Now, I don't mean just bright. I mean competent, capable able to get things done, skilled in any way, right? This is, where, this is where, but a typical woman is much closer to a housewife than she is to a career woman. What is the implication of this? What's the implication of this? What do you do with this information? What do you think about it? This is not rhetorical, it's a real question. <laughs> what do you think? Oh gosh, oh yes. <laughs> right? Are you being perceived as a typical woman or as a career woman? Because with a t if you're perceived as a typical woman, what should you be working to, to make sure people understand? You're that you're competent. Yeah. You're going to work like a crazy person to show people that you're competent. If you're being perceived as a career woman, what are you going to do? You're going to bring the cupcakes to work, <laughs> right? Because you want people to think that you're likable, right? You know what we, I mean, you know what this is called? It's called the double bind, right? It's called the double bind. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. The double bind for women is that we're trying to be both warm and competent because to be influential, I'll show you some more data in a moment, to be influential, we need to hit both of those markers. And it's really hard because we don't know if someone's seeing us. If, again, if I know that you just see me as a, as a regular old woman, I'm going to work the competence angle really hard. If you're seeing me as a career woman, I'm going to work the likability and warmth angle really, really hard. It is exhausting to be a woman. <laughs> you are constantly trying, if you're smart, to suss what, what do they need and how do I do that. 
And if you get the calculation wrong, right, it's, it's, it can be a real problem. Okay, let me go back again, make sure that we got this. Again, let's go back a bit, right? So again, as I've said, a typical woman and then a professional woman, again, the stereotypes that people hold are both descriptive, it's how people think about typical women and career women, but they're also prescriptive. They tell us how we're supposed to behave. If I run around with a stereotype in my head that a housewife's supposed to be very, very likable and fairly low in competence, if that woman is not likable, that is jarring. What? How can that be? It doesn't make any sense. You're a housewife. Housewives are likable. You're supposed to be baking all the cookies for the kids. You're supposed to be full of happy energy when people come home at the end of the day. That's your job. That's my stereotype of you. Right? So again, I think what we have to recognize is not just so much, well, I'm just not going to bother with this because there's going, this is where backlash comes from. It's the violation of the expectation. If I violate your expectation of me, you are going to get upset and be thrown off and then say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I liked it when you were in the box. That made my life so much easier. I could predict exactly. When you don't behave in ways that are predictable, it makes other people uncomfortable, right? We don't like to deal with unpredictable people, right? It just makes it harder. Right, so this is what happens with the stereotype violation. Okay, so the trick for us, by the way, I don't wear a watch, so I never know what time it is. So um, I just, okay, I just wait for people to tell me. Okay, so the double bind again is this warmth and competence, right? So um, the good news is that I think there are ways we can do this. I think there are ways we can do this. Oops. So let's think about, so, so I, I pulled out a bunch of research that was done several years ago now. This is not research, of, none of this is research that I do. It informs the work that I do, but my work is very different from this. Um, but, it's, but I love the, I think it's really good stuff, so that's why I'm sharing it with you. There are certain characteristics that can change people's minds. That is, there are certain behaviors that we can enact that will help us persuade people. And that's really the theme of today. It's really about persuasion, right? What is that art and science of persuasion? So let's look at this. I'm going to show you the source data for this in a minute. It's going to be overwhelming, but I think it's really important that I show it to you. So for men, um, the man is trying to be, is the one to be persuaded. They're sitting on that side of the room, I think, right? So people who, who want to be the audience is men, right? When women speakers demonstrated likability, the women were more influential. When men speakers demonstrated competence, they were more influential with men, okay? Here's where things get really hard for us because for women expected different things. Women said, when women speakers were either likable or competent, I'm willing to go with it, right? When men speakers de demonstrated likability or competence, I was more likely, to, I was willing to go with it. But men had a much stronger um, sense of what they wanted to see in the man or the woman giving the, giving the address, may, trying to make the persuasive argument, which makes it a little bit challenging, okay? I'm not showing you this outcome for any particular reason, except to say you can thread this needle. And the paper threaded this needle in a beautiful way. So let me show you that. I'll get to that in just a minute. I, I want to actually take a break here. How do you, so I want to get your ideas on this. How do you, Communi Some of you, I mean, obviously you're successful, right? So how do you do this? How do you simultaneously communicate warmth and competence? You must do it because you're successful. You're doing it. How do you do it? Do you do it consciously? Again, not rhetorical. <laughs> right? So do you do it consciously? I think it depends on the person you're communicating with. Okay, so it depends on who you're communicating with. So what's the contingency? What's your heuristic? What's your, if this person is X, I do X. If this person is Y, I do Y. Okay. Can you get more, do you want to get more specific? If you understand someone's personality and how challenged they can be, you okay. adjust your okay. style and Okay, interesting, right? So you may decide I'm going to play low a little bit, be deferential. That Deb Grunfeld at Stanford does this wonderful research on, on how do you play low versus play high, right? If I'm, if I'm low status, I play low. I'm deferential. I look up from under my eyes, right? I have small gestures, that kind of thing, right? If, if, um, uh, if the person is low status and I want to assert status, I'm going to play big, right? I'm going to look away. I'm going to be a little bit rude, that kind of thing. Okay. What else? How else do you do it? Yeah, that's the recommendation. It's fascinating. Uh, what is the, what's the rest of it? How do you do it? How do you manage? Do you manage warmth and competence? Do something likable well. So do something likable well. If you're going to bake, bake well, 
Yeah, well, yeah. Yes. You something, but you do it well. Okay, that could be one. What's another one? I'm going to suggest you never bake for the office. That's going to be my, my you know, as a sink, as a, oh, no. As long as the men are baking, you're fine. Whatever the men are doing, I'm doing that, right? Right? If that's the way to do it. Right? So, okay, so how else can we do it? Okay, so you know who you're talking to. So some of it is, you guys are, right, you're thinking, look, I, I've got a message. I've got to figure out who my target is for that message, right? I'm going to get to that at the, at, the back, at the back end a little bit. This is very much focused on the words we're using. Is there anything else that you do? Smile. 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 I've actually stopped smiling. Stop smiling. <laughs> Why do you stop smiling? Well, I found earlier in my career being likable was really effective. Later in my career, as I get um, more responsibility, mm -hmm. I need to dial up the competence, competence piece. piece. And so uh -huh. I've become less smiling. Humorless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stark. Stark. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Do you think about how you dress? Does that communicate anything about your competence and likability? Do you think about how you hold your body? Does that communicate anything about your competence and likability? Which seat you sit in? Which seat you sit in? So there might be something about being deferential. We have all of these tools. We all do, men and women. We have all of these tools. What I'm going to urge you to do is to think about how you, what your brand is, right? How you're communicating that, right? So I can tell. So here's a little personal story. So I teach MBAs. I teach MBAs and executive MBAs primarily, both at Cornell and I've been there for almost 20 years and at LBS the last few years. And um, I don't teach daytime MBAs anymore because I've just I've been doing it a long time and I'm done with it. Um, and in part because my last round of evaluations, there were two sets of people who hated me. One said, "It's all right." It's, uh, uh, one group said, "You're not smart enough to teach here, and they never should have hired you." I've been there for 20 years. It seems kind of silly, doesn't it? I've been there longer. I mean, they're not even right. They were five when I got hired. <laughs> But it was a competence-based argument. You're not competent. And the second set was, you're an icy person. You're unapproachable. You're just not very, essentially, you're not very likely. You're not warm enough to be a female faculty member here. <laughs> right? So, so those are the two dimensions. So I can, right? So, so part of the challenge then for me, and maybe shared by some of you, is how do I demonstrate both competence and likability? For some people, I overstepped on the competence, right? Or I didn't do enough. I should say I didn't do enough because they thought I wasn't competent. And for others, I didn't do enough to show likability, right? So some of the, and this is the same challenge that many of us face. How are we, right, how do we dress? So normally I wear a dress to events. I'm sort of a little bit more informal. Um, but I sort of said, no, I have to somehow look competent. So looking competent means you have to wear a jacket, right? Looking competent means I have to wear these stupid shoes. Looking competent <laughs> means whatever it means, I have to wear makeup, right? Whatever. So, so I think that there are ways, again, all of us have to come up with ideas about how are we going to do this? How do we communicate likability? I teach negotiation. I do research in negotiation. What negotiation researchers find all the time is that when women behave in ways that are agentic, they ask for things, they want things. There's backlash. You're not supposed to be agentic as a woman. You're supposed to be communal as a woman. You're supposed to take care of the crowd. You're supposed to be. So the way to get stuff in negotiation, right, is to adopt a more relaxed posture, to have your hands open all the time. It's not very threatening, right? You can't be threatening. And you have to use we language. And you have to ask for things that are largely be, that are framed in a way that are going to benefit other people, not you. Again, it, it's very exhausting to be a woman at work, right? We are constantly trying to think through these issues, right? So, so again, so some of it is how do we hold our hands? How do we decide what we're going to wear? And then I'll get to the point about and how do we talk, right? That'll be a separate piece. But I want you to be thinking about in all situations, how am I communicating? I love the idea that early in my career, I wanted to sort of build a network. I wanted to become a trusted advisor, right, to people around me. I was using likability. As I build into my role and I become, have more responsibilities, more competence is demanded. And so I'm going to have to pull back. Because you're right to say it's a trade-off. If we decide we're going to build up our likability, it can come at a real cost to our competence. Right? You can see situations where this can happen to people. Like she's really likable, so people think she's not very bright. Or she's really bright and really competent, so obviously she's just a horrible person. 
right? She's a very dislikable person. You could see how these trades get made a lot. We have to be very careful about how we're balancing these all the time. And again, if I knew how to do it better, those evaluations would have looked different. So we're all sort of struggling with it. Okay. In the data I showed you a moment ago, I'm, I'm highlighting something here for you. There was a winning style that was, a, that, was, uh, that was identified by the authors of that study. There was a winning style, and I want to share it with you, because this has everything to do with how you're doing it and less about what you're saying. We'll get to the what you're saying in a moment. They looked at several dimensions, and they evaluated how persuasive the speaker was, men and women. They found some differences for men and women. I'll get to those in just a moment. But here's what they found in these various dimensions. The, this, the winning strategy was called social, and I'll show you the comparison in just a moment. How much eye contact is there to be persuasive? These are all out of nine points. Moderately high. So the eye contact has to be there, but not too much to be threatening. There should be moderate voice loudness, not too firm, not too firm. Again, you want to avoid being um, too challenging and threatening. Very little anger in the voice. Having a somewhat rapid, so you've got a flow to your speech. Very few hesitations and stumbles. I'm not telling you anything that you couldn't imagine. I'll show you the, com the, the comparisons in just a moment. A moderately high facial expression, so not at the very top of the scale, but generally open, relaxed, with moderately calm hand gestures, which really meant they picked this piece out to say, you can engage your gestures to reach people, to sort of connect with them, as long as you're not, again, kind of threatening them. A lot of this, to me, when I read through this, just looked like sh sureness. It looks like um, confidence. It looks like confidence. And I'm, I'm sure that that's what's actually underneath a lot of this, right? That we're all more credible when people in the audience feel safe with us, right? If a speaker comes up and talks to you and seems shaky and uncertain and kind of sweaty, it, it makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? We just feel so uncomfortable for that person and we kind of want it to end and we don't really feel, and then someone asks a really hard question and they're like, oh God, right? And then there's, you know, and then there's blood in the water and then everyone is uncomfortable, right? You've been in that situation. It is agony for everyone, for the speaker, for you who's empathetic, right? All these problems. So a lot of it is just, you know, how do we do the persuasion? Certainty, confidence, sureness. Can you fake those behaviors? Yeah, you can. One of my colleagues, Hermini Ibarra, I didn't cite her book here, she has a book called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And the whole point of that is first you act like a leader, you just wear the clothes and you hold your hands, and then people think you're a leader and then you get away with it. <laughs> right? So a lot of it is sort of how we're presenting ourselves. And this is very non-threatening but very certain. Very open, demonstrating both competence in the confidence, and likability and the warmth in the hand gestures, right? So it threads that needle a little bit. Let me give you a little bit more on this one. The contrast for this was something, again, it'll be in the deck, and if the deck is given to you, the contrast was, is there a nonverbal style that might be more likely to persuade an audience? And they couldn't find it. It was this, the social one that I told you about. There was also a more submissive, kind of asking, pleading, sort of more, um, more quiet, kind of pulled back, not persuasive. A more dominant one, also not persuasive. It was too much. People put their guards up. And finally, one that was really very neutral and just really, and they called it task focused. That also wasn't successful. You really need that warmth behind it to make it effective, right? Which is why I'm showing you this nonverbal piece. Okay. So I'm telling you that we have to find ways, each of us, to demonstrate warmth and competence. Some of it's going to be through the body language, some of it's going to be through how we dress, some of it's going to be the tone of voice we're using, whether we're smiling or not smiling. There's a lot of deliberation that goes into it. The good news is that the more you practice it, the more it becomes a habit and becomes sort of who you are and part of your brand. And so I think that that's a little bit more hopeful. So we spent a little bit of time on how you say it and how you look when you say it. Let's get to the stuff that you're going to get out of some books. I put it together. Um, uh, this is how I talk about it, and I kind of gathered it from a number of different studies. So let's get into that piece, how you say it. So here's my three-step model on how to say it. Okay, this is the talking stuff that we were emphasizing earlier. The first thing, you simply have to establish some credibility. Right? And this is, again, decades of research on influence show this. Credibility for your idea and for yourself. Make it easy for them to say yes, and then take the easy way out. I am so lazy that whatever I can, whenever I can sort of get them to, to do things without thinking about it too hard, I'm going to do it. So I'll show you what that means in just a minute. OK. So the first is establish some credibility, right? And that's what you guys are talking about. Do your homework, who are you talking to, that kind of thing. 
How do you do it? Um, I'm going to give you a couple pieces here. The first is get big. If you've got allies, particularly powerful allies, right, it's much easier to, get to persuade someone. Right? They've already got some backing for someone else. That's going to be very easy to walk into the room and sort of say, I've already started to sort of accumulate some of that. Right? So get big. Find allies. Use your network. Find allies. Borrow credibility. This is one of my favorites. Right? Get introduced by somebody. Right? I always want to get in, you want to get introduced by somebody who's got some credibility. Right? I'm not going to send you a, a I'm not going to cold call you. Right? I'm going to get somebody else to sort of say, you should really talk to whatever. And that's part of how you build your credibility. Right? You borrow it. A third is, again, we talked about this, the sureness that you're conveying, right? The bigness that you're conveying, the sense that I know what I'm talking about and I'm helping you on the, as the recipient to feel safe. So you can feel like, okay, this is a safe pair of hands, right? I can go along with this idea and there's no danger in it, right? We're trying to always make people feel safe. Play the diplomat. It's much easier right, to get your idea adapted, adopted if you can acknowledge some of the likely risks and downsides, right? So this is sort of when you're engaged, you know, we do a lot of teaching of critical thinking these days and sort of, you want to acknowledge some of those and then downplay them, right? Well, I guess they've thought through this. It's not whether you've actually identified all the risks and challenges. What are you doing? You're relying on people's interest in not doing too much hard work. Well, she looks confident and she's thought about some of the risks and challenges. She probably knows what she's talking about. Perfect. You don't have to go any further than that. Just sign here, sir, right? Just put your name right there, right? I'm trying to get you to stop asking questions about whether I'm the safe pair of hands, right? That's persuasion. Okay. Make it easy for them to say yes. Again, this is a classic, and I teach negotiation, right? It's a classic in, in negotiation. I love it when people go into the negotiation, they know exactly what they're gonna ask for, and then you say, perfect. Now, what's in it for them? What? What do you mean? Well, it's a negotiation, so you're going to get something and they're going to expect something in return, right? Well, what am I going to give them? I don't know, but this has to be part of what you're thinking through as you prepare, right? We spend so much time thinking about what we want and how to ask for it that we don't really think about what we're going to offer in return, right? So in sales training, if some of you have gone through sales training, right? The sales training is always, imagine they're wearing a hat that says, what's in it for me, right? And then you'll remember, right, that you have to pitch to them, make this attractive and maybe provide something. Okay, so know your target, and some of you were saying this a moment ago, right, when I asked you for some, for some feedback. What are their problems? What are their constraints? What are the needs? How are you going to help them solve their problem? What's their problem that your solution is going to help them with, right? I don't want to hear. I say to my own children, don't give me problems, give me solutions. I'm a terrible, weird mother, right? <laughs> don't present me with problems, present me with solutions, right? Start turning some hypotheses about why your life isn't going your way, right? And then I can help you with it. <laughs> I'm very laissez-faire. All right, so the second is clearly articulate the problem on their, in their terms, right? If someone doesn't speak to me on my terms, I'm likely to tune them out, right? I'm just trying to, right, I'm gonna walk along next to them instead of trying to get them to, to understand my perspective, okay? Again, consider what's in it for them. What are you gonna give them? How are you gonna make their life easier? How is this solution going to make their lives easier? And then the third is, and this is the entire book, that's Robert Cialdini's book on influence, the entire book is dedicated to this, is a slide, right? So I don't have to go through it in too much detail. But here's how people make decisions, and this is decades of social psychological research. They do one of two things. You know this stuff, right? This is your business, right? They either carefully consider arguments, weighing the pros and cons, thinking about the data, try and interpret it, right? calculating the probabilities, or they just rely on some heuristics and shortcuts. When the issue is really important to us, we probably do this. Every other moment, we do this. We rely on shortcuts, right? Because we, don't, we only have 24 hours in the day. I don't have time for all of this nonsense, right? And as you get more senior, you have even less time for all of this nonsense, right? So I'll rely on some heuristics. Let's use those to our advantage. What are some of the heuristics, right? So you can go through the maze, you can shoot right through. Again, shoot right through when you can. So here are some, again, this is all in the Cialdini book. There's one principle called liking. This is not rocket science, it's social science, right? If you like them, they like you. If they like you, they're more likely to buy it. You attract more flies with honey than with vinegar. Isn't that the old saying? Do you know that expression, right? You can be kind of tough and prickly when you need to, but they're unlikely to go along with it. 
right? There's some great research that says if you have a choice between dealing with an incompetent but likable person and a super competent but not very likable person, you will run at the incompetent person every single time because they're just easier to deal with, right? Because they just don't make your life hard. You will squeeze every last bit of competence out of that person <laughs> before you go to the, to the more competent person. Use this to your advantage. The more someone likes you, for whatever reason, the more you're gonna, right? The more they're gonna say yes to you. If you do something for them, they're more likely to do it for you, right? These are, there's sort of a, right, reciprocity. Anthropologists find, uh, Gould found, right, in the 60s, that it was a, it was a cross-cultural um, norm, this reciprocity norm. That if I, I mean, think about it, right? So the holidays are coming. Uh, so, you know, somebody gives you a gift and you don't have a gift for them. Now, an economist would say, score, right? Your utility just went up. You got a great bottle, right? You're like, yeah. But you're not. What are you actually? Indebted. Oh, my God. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I left yours. It's right in the hallway. Ah, I didn't remember it, right? Ah, I gave my wife one in the car. Whatever, right? I mean, you're just, ah, it's embarrassing. Everyone feels awkward. Stop, right? Why? Because of this norm of reciprocity. Right, so if I give, you will give in return, right? So again, these are the kinds of things that Cialdini would say, why aren't we not using these more often if we know what these shortcuts are? Yeah, am I doing okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Finally, and there's a lot of uh, emergent stuff around this, is the importance of an emotional story. I'm guessing that this is something that you guys think about, right? That there are groups in London, for sure, there's a cottage industry that's, well, it's very lucrative, that's grown up around teaching people, how to, leaders, how to tell stories. How do you, what's your story? What's the company's story? People tend to like a vivid emotional story, right? They won't even dig that hard underneath to make sure the story is accurate. My election, right? So <laughs> turns out that a compelling emotional story moves people, right? There's some wonderful examples. There's another book, a wonderful book called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath, Switch. It's also about how you change minds. And they talk about, can you get something that's sort of tangible, right? If you think that the pricing of something isn't quite right, get the box of the gloves and dump them on the table with the price tags on them and show what is this mess that we're dealing with. The more you can make it vivid and compelling, the easier it's going to be. Is that a lot of work? It is, but that's kind of your job when you're persuading people, right? So these are the shortcuts we want to, we want to use. So again, getting them to like you makes a huge difference. We will go so far, and there's, again, a lot of studies on this. There, there are a lot of studies that show how far we will go when someone likes us. Think about the things you have done for people you like. You're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> right? Why did I do that? Because you liked them and they asked you, right? And you just couldn't say no, right? So I'd guard against it. These are things you probably want to guard against, but also use if you can. Get them to trust you. Have you done the correct analysis? Your preparedness and calmness will take you very far. Two emotions are going to create the urgency you need for change, by the way. So persuasion, if it's about a change, you're trying to persuade someone to change the way they're doing things, there are two ways you can do this and both work. Change is almost impossible without a sense of urgency. Any organization, any, so it's almost impossible. Cause, ah, it's so much work. Things are fine. Right? When things are fine, nothing changes. It's very, very hard. Right? So you need, there are two emotions you can use. You can use fear. Ah! the sky is falling, right? Oh my gosh, we got to lift it up, right? Or hope. Things could be better, even better than they are today. And let me paint you a picture of what that looks like. The ability to craft stories that have that emotional tone to them is a really wonderful skill when you're trying to persuade and you're trying to lead. Because most of your job when you become, when you're in positions where you're leading, which many of you are, right, is that you can't tell people what to do anymore. You have to get them to follow you. You have to show them a vision of the future and get them to move along with you. These are the ways we're going to do it. Okay. So effective persuasion, I'm at the end, right? So effective persuasion, I'm trying to convince you, is a function of what we say. That was the last piece of the talk, right? Credibility, reciprocity, those kinds of things. How we say it, using this sort of social kind of signaling, right? This likability signaling, confidence, openness, that kind of thing. And finally, again, how we look when we say it, right? How am I through how I dress, how I stand, how I modulate my voice, how am I communicating competence and likability? And not too much of either. Oh my God, it's so hard. 
Yeah, if it sounds like it's really hard, it is, which is why I'm pushing some stuff at you to do some additional work on this, right? Because you really have to figure out what your presence is going to look like. That's what I got. Mm -hmm.